Let's try this today. Um, John chapter 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Thank you very much. Let us be blessed. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. That that is the that is the um the foundation and the essence of what we would like to speak about today. But before we go into that, I, I just want to ask that the Lord um, bless his message and my unworthiness and make it worthy. Um, so if you would please pray with me, I just want to have a moment. Loving Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word that you left for us that continues to speak to us today. It's eternal. It is evolving. That it is like mining for gold in the earth with pick and shovel to uncover gems and jewels that you've left for us that are only there if you seek. Lord, please, please accept my, my hum, human frailties and, and difficulties of, of, of understanding and, and eloquence of speech. And may your Holy Spirit speak for itself and may it do the work that it is there to do, which is to burn our hearts with a love that you want us to have in response to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I mentioned in the Sabbath school how that my parents would have uh, arguments about Christmas and my mum was uh, such a soft-hearted, delicate person. And her emotions were, I think I've said this before, were always very close to the surface. And she could both laugh and cry at the same time because she just had no... Um, no difficulty in, in, in feeling what she was and just demonstrating what she was feeling. And she said something once during one of our discussions where they'd stuck in my mind. She was, she was, of course, arguing her position with my father. And she said that the greatest sacrifice that Jesus made was not on the cross. It was when he left his father in heaven. That burnt in my mind. And, and I've, I've always felt that, but I never knew how I could substantiate that. Um, and so it came up in our Bible studies recently when we were talking about the position of Christ in 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 relation to his father and to his pre-existence, etc. And I thought to myself, because um, one of the things my mother was saying was that the, 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 the one opportunity we have to reach the world about Jesus is is when they're acknowledging him. They're saying this is the birth of Jesus. And then we should be ready with those questions of who, who is he a and why are we going to celebrate? Why are we going to put um, so much emphasis on it being the birth of Christ as Christians? Um, because if we don't know him, if we don't understand 
um, what his existence is all about, then we've pretty much um, wasting our time. So she, she was she was saying, let us let us take this opportunity to examine the life of Christ. And um, and I thought coming up to Christmas now, those words burnt in my soul. And I thought, I want to try and understand why my mother was so sure that the greatest sacrifice was not on the cross, but when he left his father in heaven. And so I thought, well, are you, where do you start looking for something like that? Um, and, and, and this is where I want to pause and say, <clears throat> I want to give thanks. I want to give thanks that I was born a Seventh-day Adventist. I want to give thanks for the Seventh-day Adventist um, movement for our prophetess, the spirit of prophecy, for, for the fact that <clears throat> we have a light as Seventh-day Adventists that should be shining in the world. We are a special people called for a special time, end time, to, to shine. <coughs> um, and how are we going to shine if we're not being wise as serpents and, and, and looking for every single opportunity to illuminate a dark world? I um, went to our prophetess because she would have given more traceable references than if I was looking in the Bible directly for this concept of pre-birth of Christ. And I have been more than, more than um, blown away by what I found. Um, and it is, so sensitive a subject that I don't want to put my words on it. I want us to read it together and I want us to make up our own understanding and opinion on that so that it is not human devising or understanding, but rather the leading of the Holy Spirit. I am going to try and do something. Um, I'm, because I, I need to show you the words so that it's not me that's saying it. I'm going to read the first quote that really got me going because I was so touched by it. And it's found in Patriarchs and Prophets. And it reads as follows. The sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate, a co-worker, who could appreciate his purpose and could care or share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Our minds can only understand so far. If we really break that down, um, it, it's almost like he's going back in steps. So the first step is in the beginning was the word. Okay, that's an item. And the word was with God, which is a next step. And then then the word was God, which is a third step. So if we if we walk backward, in the beginning was God. And then we have the word was with God. And then we have the word. So you either, either way, 
you come back to the same thing. The word and God are somehow one and the same thing. But let's go further with her quote from Patriarchs and Prophets. And it says, Christ, the word, the only begotten of God, was one with the eternal father, one in nature, in character, in purpose, the only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. His name shall be, um, the, uh, sorry, this, yeah, so this is now quoting from uh, Isaiah. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. He is the Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. Did anybody ever stop and think he's the son? How is he now being called the Everlasting Father? The Prince of Peace. This is loaded because although he's referred to as the son, he is somehow also the father. This is the mystery that we struggle to understand. So if we go forward then from, that's Isaiah 9 verse 6. Then we have this verse. His goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So this is now Ellen White explaining who the sovereign of the universe is. And she is saying that in Micah 5 verse 2, when it says his goings forth have been from old, uh, from everlasting, is referring to Jesus. That's Micah 5 verse 2. Then it says, and the son of God declares concerning himself. This is Ellen White saying that he declared this of himself. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting when he appointed the found foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him and I was daily his delight rejoicing always before him. Can anyone guess where that is from? She's quoting from the Bible and let me just go through it again. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Any guess where that's from? This blew me away. It's actually taken from Proverbs. 8, 22 to 30. I'd like you to go there. And I would ask Adorbe if it's possible for you to um, give me some sh screen sharing because when I read this, I was, no, I don't know if that's difficult. Okay. Um, when I read this, I was so intrigued that this verse was from Proverbs because I've always understood Proverbs as the wisdom of Solomon. So anything written there, we always try and fit it into, into the wisdom of Solomon, and more in terms of counsel, more in terms of um, uh, his wise ability to discern how to judge people, how to, uh, how to reach people in these, you know, in crisis and sort of that sort of thing. But I thought, no, I have to go now. I have to go and I would really examine um, this verse in Proverbs because I want to understand it better. So if we, if, if, if we can, um, if I can share my screen. 
uh, I wanted to put on the screen what you wanted, uh, but if you want to do it, that's fine. Oh, have you got? Have you got? Are you the ability to put the Strong's version of this? With I, the... I don't. I don't. Okay. No. I, I can uh, stop the sharing, and you can do the sharing. Yeah. Yes, please. If you would do that. Here yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to share screen. Sorry. Oh, it says uh, host disabled participants screening sh screen sharing. Here we go. Can you try now to share? Thank you. Um, Sorry, just let me find my way around quickly. I want this window. I want to share. Um, okay, here we go. So we've got Proverbs. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Not, not anymore. No? No. Um, what happened? Let me, let me open the... Um, screen let me go to share again oh i know what it is i was I, um i was trying I, I actually did click on the stop share because my cursor is underneath there so can you see my screen now yes i have to be very careful on um bringing it down so that we're back up to 20 22 okay now you can see how i'm using the strong's the strong's edition because i want to examine the words in proverbs to see how this is christ speaking uh, about himself through solomon and i am breaking it down word by word and i want you to look at this the lord um and there we have it self-existence or eternal jehovah Jewish national name of God, Jehovah, the Lord. So he is Jehovah, the Lord. Possessed. Let's have a look what that means. And it says a primitive root to erect, that is, create by extension to procure, especially by purchase. <clears throat> um, causatively sell by implication to own, to attain, to buy, to uh, teach, to keep cattle, get, provoke of jealousy, possess, purchase, recover, redeem. Okay, so when he says the Lord possessed him, <coughs> it he, he, he owned him, um, and it implies at a cost, at a purchase. Okay, he, put, he possessed me in the beginning, and in the beginning, yeah, beginning is from the same as, and it gives a root word, and it says the first in place, time, order, or rank. Uh, specifically, a first fruit, a beginning, uh, chief, fruit, part, uh, time, principal thing. So it is um, the beginning being the principal, the the very first, the very first existence, as it were. <coughs> Or ever, and these, you've got two options here. It says properly a part of, hence, from or out of, in many senses, above, after, among it, because, and the other one is <clears throat> in front of, uh, of a place, um, absolutely the four part, literally the east, which interested me, or time, antiquity, often used at, uh, uh, adverbially before anciently eastward aforetime ancient before east eternal um forward old past compare so it, it, it is before ever um is ancient referring to ancient <coughs> the earth let's have a look at that word for 
an unused root probably meaning to be firm, the earth at large or part partitively of land, common, country, field, uh, sorry, earth, field, ground, land, nations, way, wilderness, world, world. Okay, so then we can go down. When there was no, that no is con concise, nothing, um, depths, depths, from the root word, um, oh, it's usually feminine, from the root word of Hebrew or something else, meaning an abyss as a surging mass of water, especially the deep, the main sea or the subterranean water supply, deep depth. So it seems to be relating to water. I was brought forth, brought forth, primitive root properly to twist or whirl in a circular or spiral manner. That is specifically to dance or to writhe in pain, especially of partition <laughs> or fear, figuratively to wait, to, per to pervert, bear, to make, to bring forth, to, to make, like to carve, dance, drive away, fall grievously with pain, fear, form, great, grieve, be, grievous, hope, look, make, to be in pain, be much sore, pain, rest, etc., etc. But you can, I want you to specifically to remember the first two descriptions, which is to twist or to whirl. Now, when we we spin something around, we, we can turn uh, runny cream into thick cream, or we can even dry out a towel by swinging it in the water can come out. So we know there's a, an effect of whirling and we also know there's a, an effect of twisting. And it says this twisting is much like when you're in pain and you're writhing or when you're in happiness and you're dancing and whirling. So we've got a descriptive word here. So it says, um, uh, I was brought forth in a twisting or whirling motion. Then we go, uh, when there was no, which is nothing. And now I want to look at fountains, the meaning of fountains here. Uh, why is it, no, no, where's this fountains? There, from, as the dominative in the sense of a spring, a fountain, also collectively, collectively figuratively, a source fountain, spring, or well. So it's looking at the source. Abounding, okay, the, but what is abounding? And I can't actually see it under, let me come down a bit, sorry. Um, try that again. The primitive root to be very heavy. That is in a bad sense, uh, burdensome, severe, or dull, or in a good sense, numerous, rich, honorable, causatively to make weighty, in the same sense, uh, abounding with, more grievously afflict, boast, be chargeable, be dim, glorify, to be make glorious, glory, great, to be grievous, hardened, to be heavy, to be heavier, um, so we get the idea of the uh, the the weight, whether it's whether it's with joy again or whether it's with pain again. It is very full of weight, and that's the abounding. And then let's have a look at the water. Dual primitive noun, but used in a singular sense. Water figuratively juice by euphemism, urine, or semen. Now, let's go back and have a look from 22 again. And we say, the Lord possessed me in the beginning. 
And we know that that possessed was to own, to, to, to have ownership of, to be a part of. And then he, um, um, of his way. So it was part of him. It was part of his way. It was almost like one, one entity before his works of old, before anything was created or anything was made or any other thing was produced, he possessed Christ. Then I was set up from everlasting. That was uh, from the beginning uh, or ever the earth was. So before anything else, he was the first. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. And that that depths gave us the the idea of of water, of a liquid deep. And it says I was wrought forth, spinning or ringing, writhing um, from fountains, which is the source. Abounding, which was full, with water being juice or urine or semen. So he's saying, I wasn't a byproduct. I wasn't juice squeezed out because there wasn't any yet. There was no depth yet. There was no liquid fountain yet there was no no um no substance of which i could have been a byproduct he is not a byproduct of the father he came out almost like he was one father who went to great pain to extract part of himself to being two persons. I am only understanding, and that's why I wanted us to read all these descriptive words together. Because if I am misunderstanding, I would rather somebody speak up and saying, no, that can't be true. But I set that background now, that in the beginning, the Lord says of himself, we were, before anything else was, we were together. Through a painful process or a joyous process, because it can be one or the other, or I suppose in his case, it can be both, of becoming two instead of one. Now, if we can go on from that, I want to come, I want to read now if we uh, the, actually let me just while I've got the screen, I want to go to um, it's, let's go to first Timothy. I'm going to go quickly first Timothy. Um, and it's for, uh, chapter three, and it's verse 16. So if I can just go down to 16. And we've got the same one again, uh, as the same sort of verse again. It says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. <clears throat> You know, when we when we first read that verse, we've come straight out of the the instructions on how to pick church elders and deacons, and um, it's very much a clinical instruction of how we, as the body of Christ, should behave and what kind of character we should have. And then he goes straight into this um, this declaration of the uh, mystery of godliness and. I up until now have always understood that that mystery of godliness is the godliness in us. The mystery of how we can be godly. 
but it's not. If you have a look at the mystery here, the word mystery, it says, from a derivative to shut the mouth, a secret or a mystery from the idea of silence imposed by initiation into religious rite. That's an example of, but it is a secret, okay? So the secret of godliness and the godliness here is piety, specifically the gospel scheme, godliness and holiness. God of uncertain infinity, a deity, especially with the supreme divinity uh, deity was manifest uh, in the, let's just go to in the flesh. And it says probably from the base, the uh, uh, it's flesh as stripped off of the skin. In other words, raw flesh. That is strictly the meat of an animal or food by ex extension, the body, as opposed to the soul, the spirit and that so on and so forth. So it's the tangible, the touchable, not the, the spiritual, part of existence um, and so God was manifest in that flesh justified uh, to render just or innocent so he made it just or innocent in the spirit so the flesh is made innocent through the spirit seen of angels preached unto the Gentiles and believed on in the world, received up and into glory. So he's actually talking about that godliness is he's actually talking about the mystery of how Christ um, is manifest in flesh like us. He's talking about how he um, was justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached unto the Gentiles. He's talking about him, not about us. And that mystery of godliness is how well, we were discussing it this morning, how God is try has done everything he can to bring us up to the restored image of God the Father by making himself flesh. Now um I wanted to cover that first here now um, because I wanted to look at some of the root meanings of that. But I'm going to end the sharing here so that we can um, take this off the screen. Um, and now I just want to um, carry on reading quotes from Ellen White. I don't want to put too much more emphasis on <clears throat> any explanation other than what we've been able to see for ourselves. Her quote that we started with here, where she quotes from Proverbs, goes on and it says, The Father wrought by the Son in the creation of all heavenly beings. By him were all things created, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And that is found in Colossians 1 verse 16. So here we see that... Um, Anything that exists, anything that exists was actually created by Christ. Yes. Right, then angels are God's ministers, radiant with the light ever flowing from the presence and, and speeding on rapid wings to execute his will. But the Son, the anointed of God, the express image of his person, the brightness of his glory, upholding all things by the world of power, by, of his power, Holds supremacy over them all. Hebrews 1 verse 3. A glorious high throne from the beginning was the place of his sanctuary. Jeremiah 17 12. A scepter of righteousness. The scepter of his kingdom. Hebrews 1 verse 8. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. Psalms 96 verse 6. Mercy and truth go before his face. And that's Psalms 89, verse 14. And this is all it taken from patriarchs and prophets. The law of love being the foundation of the government of God. The happiness of all intelligent beings depends upon their perfect accord 
with this great principle of righteousness. God's desire from all his creatures to God desires from all of his creatures, the service of love, service that springs from an appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience and to all his, he, he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. We go to um, the next quote. And it is here found before he came to this earth. And this one is taken from from the heart, a book from the heart. Do we I've not heard of that one before, but it's it's, it's, a, it's a devotional. OK. Before he came to this earth, Jesus was a great king in heaven. He was as great as God. And yet he loved the poor people of this earth so much that he was willing to lay aside his kingly robe, his beautiful robe, and come to this earth as one of the human family. He could have come to earth in such beauty that he would have been unlike the children of humanity. He could have come in such a way as to charm those who look upon him. But this was not the way that God planned he should come among us. He was to be like those who belonged to the human family and to the Jewish race. His features were to be like those of other human beings. And he was not to have such beauty of person as to make people point him out as different from others. He had come to take our place, to pledge himself in our behalf, to pay the debt that sinners owed. He was to live a pure life on the earth and show that Satan had to had told a falsehood when he claimed that the human family belonged to him forever and that God could not take them out of his hands. Mankind first beheld Christ as a babe, as a child. His parents were very poor and he had nothing in this earth save that which the poor have. He passed through all the trials that the poor and lowly passed through from babyhood to childhood, from youth to adulthood. In his youth, he worked with his father at the carpenter's trade and thus showed that there is nothing of which to be ashamed in work. Though he was the king of heaven, yet he worked as a humble trade at a humble trade and thus rebuked all idleness in human beings. Those who are idle do not follow the example that Christ has given. For his, for from his childhood, he was a pattern of obedience and industry. He was as a pleasant sunbeam in the home circle. Faithfully and cheerfully, he acted his part, doing the humble duties that he was called to do in his lowly life. Christ became one with us in order that he might do good do us good the world's redeemer did not live a life of selfish ease and pleasure he did not choose to be the son of a rich man or to be in a position where people would praise and flatter him he passed through the hardship of those who toil for a living and he could comfort all those who have to work at some humble trade the story of his life of toil is written so that we may receive comfort out of it. So that is from the heart. And then we go to, um, this is a Bible echo. And it says, Jesus left his home in heaven and came to this dark world to reach to the very depths of human woe that he might save those who are ready to perish. He laid aside his glory in the heavenly courts above, clothed his divinity with humanity, and for our sake he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. He came to the earth that was all seared and marred with sin, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He submitted to insult, 
and mockery, that he might leave us a perfect example. When we are inclined to be mag to magnify our trials, to think we are having a hard time, we should look away from self to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All this he endured, that he might bring many sons and daughters to God, to present them before the universe as trophies of his victory. Um, let me go to the next quote. Before the entrance of evil, there was peace and joy throughout the universe. All was perfect harmony with the Creator's will. Love for God was supreme. Love for one another, impartial. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character and purpose, the only being in all the universe that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. By Christ, the Father wrought in the creation of all heavenly beings. By him were all things created that are in heaven, whether there be, where be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And to Christ equally with the Father, all heaven gave allegiance. He was worshiped as God by all creation, which was made by him. The law of God being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all created beings depended upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, homage that springs from an intelligent appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced allegiance, and to all he grants freedom of will, that they may render him voluntary service. We cannot, we cannot, the, the, the emphasis that God wants us to love him responsively and not out of any other duty or fear. There's nothing, there is nothing worth our hard service our beating the brow, our punishing ourselves, or making ourselves do things we don't want to do. God doesn't want it. He wants our love. He loved us first. He gave everything he has because of that love. And all he's saying is just love me back. And when we get that right, we, we begin, only then begin, to allow God to live in us, to reproduce in us that which he set out in creation, to make in us from the start. People with whom he could share the purpose of his existence, was, which was love. And then we go on to the next one. I'm sorry, I'm going to try and be real quick. Before the foundation of the world were laid, Christ... The only begotten of God pledged himself to become the redeemer of the human race. So before the world was laid, he pledged himself to be the redeemer of the human race. Should Adam sin? Well, Adam fell. And he who, who was partaker of the father's glory before the world was, laid aside his royal robe and kingly crown and stepped down from high his high authority to become a babe in Bethlehem that by passing over the ground where Adam stumbled and fell he might redeem fallen human beings he subjected himself to all the temptations that the enemy brings against men and women and all the assaults of Satan could not make him swerve from his loyalty to his father by living a sinless life he testified that every son and daughter of Adam can resist the temptation of the one who first brought sin into this world. Christ brought men and women power to overcome. 
he came to this world in human form to live a man as as live a man amongst men he assumed the liabilities of human nature to be proved and tried in his humility he was a partaker of the divine nature in his incarnation he gained in a new sense the title of the son of god so the title of son of god was gained anew by becoming a babe um said the angel to mary the power of the highest shall overshadow thee therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of god while the son of human being the son of a human being he became the son of god in a new sense thus he stood in a, in our world the son of god yet aligned by land by birth to the human race Christ came in our human form to show the inhabitants of the unfallen, unfallen worlds and of the fallen world that ample provision has been made to enable human beings to live in loyalty to their creator. He enjoyed, enjoyed the temptations that Satan was permitted to bring against him and resisted all his assaults. He was sorely afflicted and hard beset. But God did not leave him without recognition. When he was baptized of John in the Jordan, as he came up out the water, the Spirit of God was a dove, like a dove of burnished gold, descended upon him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It was directly after this announcement that Christ was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, Mark says, immediately the spirit delivered, delivereth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness, 40 days, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts. And in those days, he did not eat anything. Um, who, I want to change the subject just a little bit here before I summarize. And it says, who will be able to behold the scars? of his humiliation the sign of the affliction and the suffering he enjoyed endured that he might win man back to his loyalty to god all the scars in his hands will be as bright beams to add to the beauty and the luster of the glorified body in which he arose and in which he ascends as the exalted king of all humanity. And that's taken from literature 81 of 1898. Then at the close of a thousand years, Jesus with the angels and all the saints leaving the holy city. And while he leaves the holy city and while he's descending to the earth with them, the wicked dead are raised. And then the very men that pierced him being raised will see him afar off in all his glory, the angels and saints with him and will wail because of him. There will see, uh, they will see the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet and where they thrust the spear into his side. The prints of the nails and the spear will be his glory it is at the close of the 1000 years that jesus stands upon the mount of olives and the mount parts asunder and becomes a mighty plain those who flee at that time are the wicked who have just been raised not um then it goes jesus will present his hands with the marks of this crucifixion the marks of it, of this cruelty will ever will ever be, bear you know, the marks of this cruelty he will ever bear so forever he's going to keep those marks every print of the nail will tell the story of a man's wonderful redemption and the dear price by which it was purchased the very men who thrust the spear into the side of the lord of life will behold the print of the spear and will lament the deep with deep anguish the part which they acted in marring his body 
Those who derided his claim to be the son of God are speechless now. There is the haughty Herod who jeered at his royal title and bade the mocking soldiers crown him king. There are the very men who with impious hands placed upon him form his form, the purple robe, upon his scarred brow, the thorny crown, and in his unresisting hand, the mimic scepter, and bowed before him in blasphemous mockery. The men who smote and spit upon the prince of life now turn from his piercing gaze and seek to flee from the overpowering glory of his presence. Those who drove the nails through his hands and feet, the soldiers who pierced his side, behold these marks with terror and remorse. I just want to go back to where I started with my first idea that my mother said the saddest story, part of the story, is what Jesus gave up. He came down to earth to become brothers and sisters with us so that he could take us back to the Father. That was planned from before the creation of the world. And when the day came, I can imagine the discussion between the Father and the Son. He says, it's time. I'm going to go now. And how they must have wept together. <laughs> because they were pledged together to redeem us. I don't know if you feel that you're a good parent. Or how, how frightening it might have been for God to choose a human mother for his son. But whatever it was going to be, they were going to go through it. There's no returning from their plan of redemption. And as we look at the baby in the manger, let us fully understand with all our heart that we were looking on our creator, our God, and what he was willing to do for us. Amen. Amen.